Now, when we're talking about um, those corrective measures that let's say are over the counter, but are specific to one's diet. Okay. I mean, probiotics, that's an area that oftentimes they see generally exploited. I see as something that, okay, we'll just throw a probiotic in that'll fix whatever the intolerance is or whatever the gut issue is. What are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on just blindly? Okay. Let's put the probiotic in. Yeah, so probiotics are supposed to be used for a specific purpose, and a lot of different probiotics do certain things, whether that's lactobacillus raminos or ruditori helping to prevent yeast infections, whether that's a spore-based probiotic that might help with the immune system or helping to bind different toxins in the gut, Saccharomyces boulardii, um, helpful for food poisoning, preventing C. diff, um, helping with antibiotic therapy, preventing diarrhea. So probiotics should be used based on what your goal is, and there are certain uses of probiotics for like test prep. For example, Saccharomyces boulardii, it might help prevent intestinal permeability and leaky gut, which is basically what every single athlete deals with. But probiotics should be used based on their purpose. And some probiotics are like fire fluid on a fire if you have an overgrowth or histamine issue. So I truly believe that most people should not need a probiotic. They should be focusing on feeding their microbiome with polyphenols and prebiotic rich foods and fiber. That way they're, the organisms in their gut are healthy, happy, and thriving, and they don't have to go in there with that short-term fertilizer because that's what it is. Probiotics, just short-term fertilizer that may or may even not colonize your gut. Sometimes it's wasting your money. They degrade in the stomach. They don't colonize. So the key thing is making sure that what is the goal and then making sure that you've taken control over your diet to have a healthy, thriving microbiome. So using them strategically is key. And there's a lot of different, like you can go on Google, there's a lot of different, you know, US probiotic guide, the Canada probiotic guide, and look at those different things, but always use them strategically. Strategically with intention. I love that. Um, are there, I would say just generally as a rule of thumb, if you're getting probiotics that don't require refrigeration, is that a red flag? Is that something that people need to be privy to? Like, are there probiotics that I guess is resilient, the right word? I mean, like they can sustain just normal room temperature or is that something like strictly, hey, if you're including that probiotic, okay. Is there yeah, any definitely. kind of they brand? Don't have yeah. to. They don't have to be shelf okay. stable. Um, there's a lot of different good brands, but key thing is getting a third-party tested high-end brand, whether that's like Garden of Life or Pure Encapsulations or Designs for Health. Um, the key thing too is even sometimes dead bacteria, we have postbiotics too. So even if it's not actually going to colonize and be live going into the small and large intestine, sometimes there actually still is a benefit to that organism, whether it's alive or dead. So I definitely would focus on if you're choosing a probiotic, make sure it's a high quality brand. But yeah, there's a huge conversation over live versus dead and what actually colonizes and what actually helps. It's, it's yeah, it's definitely in the weeds. Okay. That's so, that's, gosh, that's so interesting. The postbiotic. I, I know have it's to so cool. That. It's so cool. Yeah. So Okay. Similar, similar line of logic with digestive enzymes. Is that something, I mean, like, I'm sure you get a lot of people who come to you who are just like, Hey, I've got papaya enzyme in place, you know, and I, I don't know specifically, is that one that you're like, okay, sweet, good baseline. Or is it like, who told you to take this? Why are you taking this? At what dose? What, what's been your experience with clients who come to you who just maybe already have them in place? Or is that something that generally you say is a good idea to have in place as a baseline? Yeah, I don't think digestive enzymes are ever going to hurt anybody um, unless it has like betaine hydrochloric acid. Um, sometimes that can cause ulceration, especially if you have H. pylori. So that's an issue. The papaya makes me crack up because it really doesn't break down anything much, but digestive enzymes are never going to hurt you. And I always think like, honestly, if you can have anything minus, of course, your teeth to help digest and break down your foods to potentially absorb more nutrients, why wouldn't you do it? So if you want to do digestive enzymes, like I'm all for it. And if you're a bodybuilder and you're eating a lot of food, that's 100% going to help you because honestly, for example, like a girl in her off season might be eating like 85 grams of fat, 300 carb, 140 to 150 protein. Her body doesn't make enough enzymes to actually break that down. So you're going to have to, and you're going to want to add in some support to break that down. Otherwise, she's going to be gassy and bloated. 
Oh, amazing. Amazing. That's so helpful. I know a lot of listeners, there's a couple clients in particular who they have come from past situations where the food kept going up, up, up. And it was like, Hey, I can't keep eating this because I'm miserable. Like this is intolerable from a gas and bloating standpoint. So I have hope for that, that too. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I have yeah, not yeah, to no, interrupt go. you. Oh, please. No, go, go off with that. What are the, what are the type, I guess, types of digestive enzymes that you would say are worth the, worth the dollar. And then, you know, with the gas bloating, I mean like, yeah, roll that right into it. Yeah. And it's, it's hard because you're, you're eating a lot of food in the off season. Sometimes it's even, um, even the quote unquote on season, the contest prep season, but digestive enzymes overall, of course, you want to look at a good amount of protease, amylase, lipase. So the protease is going to digest the proteins, um, the amylase, the carbs and the lipase, the fats overall, just have a good amount. Unless you're, you need at least about 60,000 IU, um, for the digestive enzymes. I love pure encapsulations, ultra digestive enzymes. There's a lot of different enzymes, but overall that's good. The key thing for the early feelings of fullness or feeling like things are not moving is you want natural prokinetics. So the prokinetic is going to kind of help push things along. It's not a laxative, but it's going to help push things along. And some of them like digestive bitters can act as a prokinetic while at the same time, helping your body to naturally, naturally release more stomach acid, digestive enzymes, um, and bile as well to help digest those fats. So, uh, help digest those foods. So I like to recommend ginger as just a natural prokinetic. You could take ginger capsules, um, or you could do something like uh, ginger tea. And then there's things like L-carnitine and 5 h TP at lower doses that can actually act as natural prokinetics as well. But yeah, definitely off season, I recommend kind of like doing a natural prokinetic and then digestive enzymes. Um, you know, there's other things that you could do to help with gas and bloating, but typically like you want to focus on like, instead of asking, do I need to add in fennel? Do I want to try activated charcoal? Instead of asking those things, first question, how are you eating? What are you eating? How are you supporting your motility and stress management first? Amazing. Amazing. I love that. Now, when we're talking about general, I, I would say healthy peristalsis, whether that individual is having, um, let's say, uh, slower, uh, slower digestion. So uh, maybe they're finding they're a little bit more constipated. Do you recommend adding in outside of vegetables? Let's say that their diet is already on the upper end of having those fiber sources of vegetables. Would you look at something maybe like a psyllium husk? I mean, like I personally use psyllium husk capsules, but um, is that one that we're given the green light or is there reason to maybe take a pause and consider using something else or not using it at all? That's a great question. So if their diet is on point, water's on point, sleep is on point, stress is on point, First thing I'm going to question is, do you have a poop routine? <laughs> Obviously, because you don't have that. That's going to be an issue. And then I like to question, okay, what are those sources of the fiber in your diet right now? Do we want to try a different source to see if your body responds better to that? Like kiwis and chia seeds versus oats um, and spinach, something like that. So trying different types of foods, switching up your diet first is key. But when it comes down to things to help you go to the bathroom, there's a lot of different things you could do. There's fibers, whether that's psyllium husk, um, acacia fiber, partially hydrolyzed guar gum. Um, there's osmotic laxatives, things that help draw water into your intestines, like magnesium citrate um, or propylene glycol, Miralax. And then there's things that are stimulatory laxatives, whether that's aloe, rhubarb, cascara. So the key thing first I like to say is use food first, fibers first. If those things do not work, and I'm a big fan of starting with sun fiber, partially hydrolyzed guar gum, so it's broken down, so it's not going to cause you gas and bloating. Psyllium husk draws water into the intestines to help produce a movement to make it a little bit more easier to pass. But I like to focus on fiber first, diet fibers first. If that doesn't work, then we can try either a low dose magnesium citrate or oxide. Those are basically going to push water into the intestine to help produce a bowel movement, but that can cause bloating and cramping or loose stools. And I actually am a fan of some use of stimulatory laxatives short term if you're constipated and as needed. So I would stay away from like the smooth move tea. I see a lot of people have issues and actually develop um, kind of like resistance against that, but you could do like, you could drink some aloe or you could try something like a low dose amount of cascara, um, or Siberian, like, or, or the or rhubarb, not Siberian, sorry, that's to help for estrogen, but rhubarb can be helpful. So fiber first, then you can try the different supplementations, but you've Amazing. got to make yeah. sure food, water, hydration, stress, 
poop environment is all taken care of. And if you're really struggling, like constipation wise, that could be a big sign that there's, there's an issue in your gut, whether that's an overgrowth or even maybe like post viral issue, you might've had some little nerve damage and your vagus nerve might need some love. So you might need to do some vagus nerve stimulation work. 